Good morning, everyone. Thank you for finding time to attend in today's webinar. I'm Feb Michael Pastora, one of the board of directors of the Ornat Iloilo chapter. Later on, Ms. Mitzi Feire will be joining us on the latter part of the program. I would like to welcome each and every one of you to our exclusive webinar entitled OR Nurses, COVID-19 Toolbacks on Infection Control. It is nice to see our ORNAP members today participating in this event. But before we start, may I ask everyone to raise their right hand if they can hear me loud and clear. Again, may I ask everyone to raise their right hand if they can hear me loud and clear. All right, just a little check before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in into the question box in your Zoom control panel. We'll bring them up during the open forum and we will also have time for the questions at the end. For the meantime, may I ask everyone also to, play, to place their microphones on mute to avoid unnecessary sounds and feedbacks. And as much as possible, also please turn on your webcams or videos and to prove and also make sure to provide your complete name that will appear in your Zoom account so as to check your actual participation. Again, may I request everyone to please turn on your videos or webcams to check your actual participation. And also make sure to place your microphones on mute to avoid feedbacks and unnecessary sounds. As for the certificates, a survey form was sent into your respective emails. We encourage you to answer and sub submit the survey at the end of the webinar to claim your certificates afterwards. Likewise, the link for the said evaluation form will be sent in our chat box so don't forget to check our chat box from time to time to have an access to this survey form. Okay, so we hope you will all learn a lot today as we have lined up everything for you to be fruitful and engaging. At this juncture, may I call on Ms. Patrine Hava of Iloilo Mission Hospital, board member of ORNAP Iloilo chapter to lead the opening prayer which will be followed, followed by your national anthem and ornap hymn. Okay, let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to gather today. We humbly ask you to bless this webinar all those who are present here and the lives of those we will encounter afterward. Feel this webinar with your presence that every ideas and objectives we will be setting and discuss will be accomplished. Dear our intentions and goals to align with your will. Remind us, Lord, always with your faithful provisions. Cover us with your peace, keep us safe, and guide us all always. All these we ask in your mighty name. Amen. And Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Before we continue, I would like to welcome those members who have just joined us today. Welcome. And to begin with, I would like And to begin with this program, I am very pleased to introduce our Ornap Iloilo chapter president as he gives his opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you from Western Visayas Medical Center, Mr. Jerwin Badana. Good morning. To our esteemed speaker, Mary Bridget Lau Naryu, Arnap Iloilo chapter officers, advisors, members, and participants, a pleasant morning. Despite this pandemic, our organization never ceased to look for way in providing quality service to continuing education programs to our fellow perioperative nurses. Through this, we will be able to equip them with additional knowledge to keep up in providing quality perioperative patient care. To the support of Sir Ray Gapos in the IPT, this event was made possible. Thank you. We greatly, we greatly grateful for your unceasing help and support to our colleagues. 
I would like also to thank our ORNOP national officers for helping us to obtain CPD units for this webinar and to our chapter advisor for the unending support and guidance. Ladies and gentlemen, without much further ado, I would like to welcome you all to our second webinar entitled OR Nurses COVID-19 Toolbox on Infection Control. Thank you and have a prolific day. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for that warm welcome. At this point, I would like to acknowledge our past presidents and advisors, and advisors for gracing us with your presence today. I'm sure everybody is excited to start the lecture proper, but first let us go through the different objectives and ground rules for this webinar. And so to give our objectives for today, may I call in Mama Celine Dabu of West Desai State University Medical Center or not Iloilo Chapter Treasure. Good morning, everyone. I would like to present the four objectives of this uh, webinar today, entitled OR Nurses COVID-19 Toolbox on Infection Control. So first, explains the science of COVID-19 screening and testing for patients and staff within the facility. Second, describe measures to prepare for resumption of effective surgery to ensure adequate PPE and medical surgical supplies. Third, illustrate the importance of knowing airborne contaminant, removal and ventilation requirements for patients' care areas. And the last, identify strategies to manage healthcare staff mental health associated with COVID-19. That's all, thank you. For the reading, for the reading of declaration of fair use, Ms. Krisha May Bagaforo of Ililo Doctors Hospital, or NAP Ililo Chapter Assistant Secretary, is here to gladly fill us up with regards to the details. For the declaration of fair use, the articles and images in this presentation are used by the speaker as examples for comments and teaching purposes. Their use are therefore aligned with the provisions of the Copyright Disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, which provides that allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comments, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. The Operating Room Nurses Association of the Philippines ORNAP, as the organizing body, is not directly involved in the preparation of the content of the visual aids of the speaker. Now, for our mechanics to access PDF copies of our webinar content, may I please call on Mr. Brian Benchidisan from Iloilo Mission Hospital, our ORNAP Iloilo Chapter Nomalic member, to explain the guidelines and mechanics. After which, I'll turn you over to Ms. Mitzi Fay to be your host for the rest of the program. Good morning, everyone. And now for the mechanics. We will distribute the PDF copies of the content of the webinar through your email address. Please make sure that, you're, that you will fill out your evaluation forms right after this webinar. The said form can be found through the link we sent you yesterday via email together with access code. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I am Mitsufei Ray, one of the board members of the Ornap Iloilo chapter, and I am one of your hosts for today. Again, may I remind you to place your microphones on mute to avoid unnecessary sound. But as much as possible, please turn on your webcam so as to check your actual participation. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. We'll bring them up during the open forum, and we will have time for that after the lecture proper. As for the survey forms, it was given to you via your respective emails, or kindly check your Zoom chat box for the link from time to time. Next on the agenda, and what we all have been waiting for, we will have Ms. Pauline Grace Ortiz of Iloilo Doctors Hospital, our Ornap Iloilo Chapter Vice President, to introduce today's speaker. Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure and honor for me to introduce our speaker today, who is going to talk to us about the infection control measures and other related topics about COVID-19, which can be of great help to us as frontliners. This is a subject in which we should all be deeply interested because of the mere fact that we are facing it today. She finished her Bachelor of Science in Nursing at UP Manila in the year 1980, at the same time, her Master of Arts in Nursing, major in Maternal Child Nursing in 1991. She then became a research assistant in various projects concerning public health. She also shares her knowledge by being a professor at University of the Philippines, Manila, College of Nursing from year 1986 to 2005, and a clinical instructor at the entry-level master's program at Azusa Pacific University School of Nursing in California, USA. In addition, she was a clinical nurse specifically on definitive observation unit in various hospitals in California in the year 2006 to 2011. She was a Golden Gull awardee of the Pacific Coast College Health Association in access to online birth control on October 13, 2017. She also have various publications, including level of acculturation, food intake, dietary changes, and health status of first-generation Filipino Americans in Southern California, Journal of the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners. Furthermore, she is also a member of the editorial team in competency-based BSN curriculum, a model revised edition in the year 2006 of the University of the Philippines College of Nursing. Our speaker is currently based in California, a clinic nurse manager, and an infection control coordinator at the University of the California Irvine Student Health Center. She's going to give us lots of practical ideas that we can apply to our working environment. Everyone, please join me in welcoming our resource speaker, Ma Maria Bridget T. Lau Nario. Hi, everyone. Good morning. And uh, although it is Hapun na ngayon dito sa California. Thank you so much for inviting me, uh, you know, to be able to share some of the things that I learned. And I always value these opportunities kasi, you know, it's always good to give back, to give back something, you know, uh, for the country which I love so much. At doon ko natutunan ang pinakamaraming mga bagay. So... I think um, wait no. okay. So um, in sharing this, I would like to just uh, give um, some some background. Um, infection control is something that is very huge in the U.S. Simply because um, it is something that uh, some people who are in charge of infection control need to be able to you know to to pass a certification exam, which in my experience, it's much more difficult than the nursing board exam. Yata ay hindi alam kung paano i-move yung slide. Okay, so so somebody has already uh, shared. Next slide, please. So um, something that's very important for us to understand is that the COVID virus is mutating. 
uh, at the start of the pandemic, we um, we know that the the genotype of the virus is more of the D six of one four G. But recently, it has been it has been it has been uh, shared that. Um, the predominant genotype of the virus that is in the U.S. is now the uh, 614G. And uh, this was not detected previously, and, but it is now, based on current studies, th this virus is more um, infectious, but people who get this uh, genotype of the virus, they are not as serious as the one that is the D614. So, so basically, it's really saying that the, the G6, G614 is the one that is more infectious, but people, um, the condition of the people who get it is not as serious as the previous one. Next slide, please. So um, our first tool is really just understanding testing and screening that the viral replication is in the upper respiratory tissues and the shedding of viruses happen in the pharyngeal tissues. So this is the reason why uh, the gold standard in viral testing is still the nasopharyngeal swabbing. Although we know now that, you know, at the start of the coronavirus, we were doing throat swabs. Then we were also doing uh, nasopharyngeal swabs. But, but we learned now that uh, and, and we were also doing blood tests. But now we know that um, people who need to be tested with the virus, we can just really do uh, the nose trails. It can be a deep nasal swab. It can be just the nose trails, which is like counting one to 10, or it can still be the nasopharyngeal swab. So um, based on recent studies, uh, the mean viral load in severe cases was around 60 times higher than that of the mild cases. That's why it's saying that people who are um, in, in severe clinical conditions, they may be having a higher viral load. What is the implication of this for people in the perioperative setting? It's very important to, do, ask, to ask the patients about um, if they are manifesting some of the signs and symptoms of the virus. Keeping in mind, in the next slides, we will be seeing that there are some people who don't really have many manifestations of the virus, but it doesn't mean that they are not infected. So this slide is really just saying that um, severe cases have higher viral loads in the body. And implication for the nurse, it means that if we are in a, in a unit that is the COVID unit, it means that we also have repetitive ex exposure to a severe, level, a high level of a viral loading. Next slide, please. So there are limitations in testing. You know, we, we have false negative tests so that we should not really use the COVID test as a standard that you know that the person if they test positive then we are very safe sometimes if the person was tested too early it means that the per person might, might you know end up showing that they are negative and um, the mean number of the mean number of days when to test the patient we know that covid-19 manifests itself from day you know, two to day 14. Uh, if a person shows the signs and symptoms on day two, or, or on the first day, it means that two days before two, that person is already infected. So that uh, the question being, what is the optimum number of days that a person should really be tested for COVID? What we're using is from a range of three to seven days. Predominantly, you know, um, many of the practitioners we test for four to seven days. So it can also be laboratory error. Um, and keeping in mind that anybody who tests negative doesn't really, they're just negative for that point in time. And uh, 
if we have like like right now in the university we are doing uh, massive testing of all the students who are living in the university campus like um, there's like 8,000 students that we want to test so we have some reports that are inconclusive we, we cannot make conclusions about them so uh, and this is uh, COVID-19 nasal swab it's also a PCR test so what we're doing right now is we repeat those inconclusive tests they may be due to the fact that there's not enough specimen that was collected, the person didn't swab really well, and we, we do a nasopharyngeal swab as the gold standard. Next slide, please. So um, this slide is really, you know, sharing with us that we can have people who are positive, but they are not symptomatic. And in, in the earliest studies of COVID-19, um, it is said that 40 to 45% of those positive for COVID doesn't really have, they don't really have a lot of signs and symptoms. So, but keeping in mind, what is important for us in the perioperative profession here? A symptomatic infection may also be associated with subclinical lung abnormalities as they have proven uh, it with CT of the lungs. So it doesn't mean that, you know, people are, you know, infected, they test positive, they don't have any signs and symptoms that, you know, we can be complacent. There are some things that are happening in the body, even if at that moment the person may not be manifesting the typical signs of COVID-19. Next slide, please. So this is a very recent study. Um, in New York, they did a retrospective study of about, you know, um, from uh, the time frame of April 5 to April 24, they looked at 99 patients um, who were swabbed using the nas um, nasopharyngeal method and these are patients before an orthopedic surgical procedure. So of the 12.1%, about 12.1% tested positive, and 58% of them are asymptomatic. And three patients develop uh, post-operative hypoxia with two requiring intubation. So, so you're seeing that, you know, so there's just, about 12 patients who tested positive, and half of those didn't have signs and symptoms. So what does this tell us? That um, it should really be a standard of care that any person who's undergoing procedures should really be tested because it, it may determine what will be also their post-operative outcome. Next slide, please. So, Basically, what I'm trying to, uh, another message that I want to say is that pandemic preparation for surgical procedures is not also about COVID-19 tests. Next slide, please. And I will explain in the next slides. So we do know now that, yeah, it's true that, you know, we're, uh, COVID-19 has a lot of respiratory manifestations. But we, now we know better that uh, COVID-19, it's like the pathophysiologic mechanism is a cytokine storm. And one of the impact of COVID-19 is that it can change the cardiac function so that it mimics cardiomyopathy and the infection of myocardial cells can lead to myocarditis and the person can become vulnerable to malignant ventricular arrhythmias. There's also the possibility of increase in circulating troponins, which are indicators of damage in the cardiac muscle. And this has been described in up to 28% of the sickest patients. Why do I have something about athletes in here? I just want to highlight something that is happening in the U.S. right now. Um, you know, sports in the U.S. is big business. And for the athletes to be able to participate in... Um, you know, to have all our baseball, basketball, softball, 
uh, athletes need to have a pre-participation evaluation. So because they run a lot, they exert, you know, they do heavy breathing. So they are very vulnerable to getting infection from one another. And so um, we, we've had athletes who, who tested positive for COVID and there is great fear that those who tested positive, they, they might have some of these cardiac anomalies. In fact, um, some of the SOP we have for our athletes right now before they start participating in sports is they need to have echocardiogram they need to have a test of troponin. They also need to have EKG. So, and, and I think the, the, the simple, you know, this, uh, this lesson that we're getting from athletes is something that um, is worth thinking about because when, when we prepare patients for uh, surgery or procedures, I know that there's got to be an assessment of their physical health but once a patient tests positive for COVID, there's a history of positive COVID, there are other components of testing and assessment that needs to be done to be sure that the operative outcome of this person will be a much better one. Next slide, please. So our second tool is telehealth. You know, um, Sa atin, no, no, it, it's so easy, you know, everything should be face-to-face, -face, even in nursing. Uh, there was a time frame that, ay, naku, walang clinical experience yan, wala siyang face-to-face, -face, wala yung bedside experience. Hindi yan, hindi yan gaanong madunong. But now, no, 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 everything. So, telehealth is now a vital tool for operative nurses. Why? because it is something that can <laughs> There are triage guidelines that need to be created. It, is a, it has been scientifically proven that um, telehealth needs um, you know, guidelines, um, education of effective tools so that we can identify uh, pre-operative and post-operative complications. So, and I'm sure uh, in your units that the doctors, dati di ba, yung parang, ay naku, walang mga telepono dyan sa bedside. Oy, walang telepono, you know. We, we don't encourage staff to have telephones while they are at work. But now, it is highly encouraged because it is the way that we want to communicate with the patient. Even post-operatively, you know, some, some of our physicians, um, in, in our university center, they, they communicate with the patients through phone calls. And then uh, keeping in mind, you know, as I'm saying, telehealth is now vital. Some operative conditions and complications have the same signs and symptoms of COVID-19. So that, you know, it's sometimes difficult. But um, through a good uh, assessment via the phone, this can be done. Um, just to highlight an example, because for example, my nurses, we, we, we do triage to a lot of patients. So how do you do um, triage on oxygenation? How if a patient is having difficulty with breathing? So it's actually very simple. You don't have to listen to the breath sounds. You know, you can do it by, you know, asking them if the patient is unable to finish a sentence while you're talking to them, that patient may have some problems with oxygenation. Next slide, please. So um, this is really just the symptom screening part. I'm just sharing that um, as part of my job as an infection control coordinator is trying to track what are the signs and symptoms that are being utilized by other countries in order to do a symptom screening for COVID-19. <clears throat> I know, you know, um, I think I haven't updated the, the Philippine column very well, but I was trying to look at other different countries. They have different, you know, they have different signs and symptoms that they consider as part of the cluster for COVID-19. 
I, I, I recall my brother, you know, he, he works with the National Health Service in England, and he was sharing with us that early on the pandemic, in England, they were, they were using the loss of the sense of taste and smell. And in the US, we were quite late, you know, in using that. Next slide, please. So um, it's, it's not really just the patients that need to be tested. The staff also needs to be screened. I use screened because not all, um, it's really very expensive to be testing the staff. And there is what we call the testing fatigue. Like in the place where I work, we will be testing students every week. And I don't know if it's going to work. Who wants to, you know, be submitting the test every week? So this is just uh, highlighting an example. Uh, when I say staff needs to be screened, like for example, in our case, every day, we receive a message in our phone asking us if we have any signs and symptoms of COVID-19. Like for me, I answered um, on Monday, this Monday, um, I was having, you know, body aches and I was having headaches. So I answered yes to that. So uh, our university uh, uh, occupational health, um, I, I was not allowed to go back to work. I can only work from home because I needed to do COVID testing. So, so that's the value of screening people. So uh, in fact, when we go to work, we have to show the result of our screening on the phone. So uh, this is just demonstrating, this is a process of University of Southern California Hospital uh, that a patient undergoing invasive procedures they are on the outpatient department. They are tested two days before, and then they are asked to isolate. And in-house patients are all tested with nasopharyngeal or nasal swabs. And, uh, and as a rule, we should consider waiting on the results of COVID-19 testing uh, for patients before doing procedures. And of course, on the day of the procedure, we have to reassess patients. Next slide, please. So what are we going to do if, you know, um, if COVID negative, we have to follow, you know, the ambulatory guidance, no, no precautions needed prior to the procedure. Now, uh, please note, this is not just COVID negative testing. It should be, even the screening for signs and symptoms should also be negative. Now, if the patient is COVID test positive, we have to provide the patient with a surgical mask. Uh, remember, this is what we call, you know, this is a two-way uh, masking. Two-way because you mask the patient and then you mask the healthcare provider. So the masking, it, it should be a surgical mask. It cannot be a face covering. So it should cover their mouth and nose and then take the patient to a private area. And the provider should wear a surgical mask before entering the patient room. This is what we call a two-way droplet precaution. Now, if the patient is not compliant with wearing the mask properly, then the nurse and provider should exit the room and put on eye protection. So this is something that the University of California came up with that uh, it, it's not the regular contact precaution. It's a droplet precaution, which includes eye protection. So I know that like some of the moderators, they're using the, you know, the face shield. So use a surgical mask and then put on the face shield. Next slide, please. So then uh, another tool that we should have is that there should be an adequate supply of PPE and med surge supplies. So the assumption is that hospitals should already have medical surgical supplies and minimum volume of infection control supplies. So I know that the Department of Health, uh, the requirement is 30 days buffer supply of PPE, at least 30 days supply of testing kits. But in other countries, the requirement is 90 days. Like um, 
in the uh, in in the area where I work, our requirement is to have ninety days. And how do you calculate? Some of you will be having this job. How will you be able to calculate the PPE and the medical supplies in a pandemic? Um, there's not many people who know how to, how to calculate it. So an easy formula is use the morbidity rates. How many percent of the population will be sick? What is the number of personnel managing one patient in a day? Like for example, how 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 do I do how do I do it? So, for example, my clinic sees 100 patients a day, and one patient is seen by at least three people. There's the nurse, there's the doctor, there's the nursing assistant. That, that's at least three. So each patient will need three sets of the PPE. So, so that is a very simple way to determine how much PPE the unit need to have. So if the infection rate for uh, COVID-19, you know, is... 10% in the community. So you would anticipate that if you have 100 patients, then 10% of them will possibly have COVID. But since, you know, um, a lot more will have um, the signs and possibly the signs and symptoms of COVID. So what I do is use roughly like 30% in order to have a buffer so you can calculate the supplies that you need. And you know, it's very interesting. Um, enero pa lamang, ano, ako, yung clinic namin, kompleto na na supplies. And they were asking me, how come, you know, the clinic has a lot? And you know what I say? I, ke I come from a country where disasters are normal. And so, I know kung paano mag-panic buying. And so, my clinic was never short of any PPE. Next slide, please. So these are just, you know, um, some examples of wipes telling us that per infection control, we should really know that different type of wipes, it, it has different uh, amount of time to kill the organisms. Like hydrogen peroxide, it kills COVID in 30 seconds, but uh, I usually use one minute that it, the surface is wet, Kavi wipes is three minutes, sunny cloth is five minutes. So you've got to read what is in the literature and what is in the recommendation. Next slide, please. So uh, still going back to the PPE. So for the perioperative nurses, it's very important to identify in your policies and procedures what are the procedures that you are doing that are aerosol generating, okay? Uh, it is okay to be managing patients in the unit that you are using a mask together with a shield. But when you are doing procedures that generate aerosol, it means that the droplets that you are dealing with are the size of less than five micrograms. So in this case, the nurse and the other members of the team should be using N95 or air purifying respirators that have been designed for that specific purpose. And when we say N95, I want to be sure that everybody knows that N95 is only as good if you were fit tested. And there, of course, we all know there are two ways of fit testing. One is the qualitative where, you know, they put the hood and they try to ask you, can you taste the bitter smell? And the other one is the quali quantitative where while you are being tested, there is a machine that measures if there is a leakage uh, from the air, from the external environment. So N95 are not very useful if the nurse has not been fit tested. So, so that is a very important principle that uh, we have to keep in mind. 
kumbaga, you know, it doesn't make any sense to be using N95 if that is not the fitting that uh, is suited for you. Like, uh, usually, lalo na yung, you know, if you lose weight, then the N95 measurement that you had, you know, the previous year doesn't fit you anymore. But if you were fitted last year and then you gain weight, it means that, you know, it got a little bit tighter. It's possible that you, you still uh, uh, have that correct fit. But if you had like nose lift or any facial surgery, then, you know, your N95 uh, fit testing should be renewed. And these are just examples um, of um, what are aerosol generating procedures. Let's go to the next slide. So um, there must be a workflow and distancing processes to create a safe environment. We know that, you know, six feet is the distance, but keep in mind the six feet is the distance. <laughs> it is much better. So uh, there should be a sequence and du duration of pre and post operative cleaning, terminal cleaning, how do you clean the machines and the scopes, physical distancing policy, the number of people that can accompany the procedural patient to the facility, and how many visitors do we accept in the peri-procedural areas. Next slide, please. So this is really just, um, I, I want to be sure, you know, we are nurses. There's got to be policies and procedures on which proceed, on what situations do we need an N95 respirator or a popper. I mean, what I'm sharing right now are really just some of the procedures in, in the area where, you know, um, which is my setting. So some uh, procedures associated with ventilation are of course a cpr intubation extubation manual ventilation in fact even the regular nebulization you know pag naglalagay ka ng albuterol dyan at gumagamit ka ng pulmo aid you know in my setting even in my clinic we consider that as a procedure that is aerosol generating Next slide, please. So um, these are other respiratory therapy procedures. Sputum induction, this is the open airway suctioning. High flow nasal cannula, which I think will be very common. Non-invasive, uh, the BiPAP. Surgeries involving airway, like tracheostomy. Um, and, and all this surgery with drilling or sewing in the airway. Next slide, please. Now, these are some, um, you know, conditions that um, are, we can use a standard ma uh, mask in patients with contagious respiratory symptoms. When I say standard surgical mask, keep in mind it is a type 2 surgical mask. It cannot be a, a mask, a, a mask that prevents the dust. It has to be Hospital grade type 2. You've got to read the label there. And wh when you do this, uh, th this, these procedures, it's better to also use a, a facial shield. Next slide, please. So, um, again, this is just reiterating, you know, uh, that we've got to be very careful about... Um, because tool number four is connected with the value of perioperative, uh, the use of telehealth. Next slide. So um, in this regard too, uh, we have to increase the procedural time availability for schedules. I mean, this time we are more careful about um, you know, how long does it take before people can reuse the OR? And, to the, and, and trying to lessen the time of exposure to aerosol generating procedures. And then how many 
uh, what is the number of employees in the OR per procedure room. And there's got to, we all know this, there's got to be a runner outside of the OR so that people do not take uh, off their PPE and then put on, uh, put on a new set. Per CDC recommendation, uh, riders must maintain six feet of spacing inside elevators even when wearing face coverings, which is kind of very difficult because our elevators are not that big or uh, wide. Next slide, please. So um, the other one is operating and procedural rooms must meet engineering and facility guidelines and standards for air exchanges. Um, I can only say that um, this is vital, nurses, we have to know. Uh, I know this is engineering, but as nurses, we have to know which is, you know, uh, are there HEPA filtration units? Are there um, HEPA filters? What is the air handling mechanisms that are present in the units where we are working? Because as you know, if there is aerosol generation in the room, how long does it take, you know, to clean that room, the airspace for that room? Next slide, please. So, this, this is another, just a reminder um, to have infectious surgery labels in the units. And as you can see, that is an intubation guard, you know, to help, uh, to, to help protect the staff that is, you know, uh, doing the intubation. Next slide. So, in, in, this, in this slide, it is just saying that there are certain rooms that, we will, that will be used by the perioperative nurses not exactly in the OR setting. Uh, there are certain rooms that needs to be um, prepared in a certain way that it should have the, the, the very good number of air exchanges per hour. The air exchanges per hour, the higher it is, this is what we call the negative pressure rooms. If, if you have certain rooms like this, you have to know, you have to ask engineering, how, how many air exchanges are there. Just because a patient is in the negative pressure room doesn't mean that you are always safe there. You have to know the more air exchanges, um, the easier, the shorter is the time to clean the room. Next, next slide, please. So this is just uh, showing how much time is needed. Look at the middle part. If you have 12 plus air changes per hour in a negative pressure room, uh, it will take about 35 minutes for the removal, 99.9% .9 efficiency in removing contaminants in the air. As you can see, if the air exchange is higher at the lowest part, if it's 50, it only takes eight minutes. Next slide, please. Again, um, it's, this is really uh, the information about uh, operating in surgical rooms and other procedural rooms that uh, you are most familiar with. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, because you, um, people can review that again. Next slide. So uh, I'm now getting to the near the end of the sharing we must not forget that we are healthcare workers and the mental health of our healthcare workers is very vital with COVID-19. Next slide. So stresses come from the following because we need to employ strict infection control measures. We are afraid that we will bring the disease at home. And there are multiple medical and personal demands. And there is a stigma of people, you know. Um, diba, I, I know that if you're in uniform and you go to the grocery, people start to walk away from you. There's a stigma sometimes. 
considering that pagod na pagod tayo sa pagbibigay ng serbisyo, but then some people are afraid of us. Next slide, please. So, there is the physical strain of protective equipment. Napakainit. Physical isolation. We cannot touch others. There's the constant awareness and vigilance regarding infection control procedures. And the pressures regarding procedures that must be followed. We cannot be within six feet. We cannot eat together during our lunch break because it's an infection control measure. Next slide, please. And then the infection control, while it is a significant concern, can be exacerbated by the fact that, you know, common flu and cold symptoms are mistaken for COVID-19. Lalo na yung ilan sa atin na meron silang asthma or hyperactive airways. Akala ng mga tao pag umuubo ka, hala, uh, ikaw ay may COVID-19 na. And then the extended symptom-free uh, incubation period of COVID-19. And then the higher mortality rate compared to influenza. And then the tension between public health priorities and wishes of patients and their families. Next slide, please. And then, so what are things that can be done? One is adjusting the staffing schedule, the staffing procedures and schedules, offering access to psychosocial support, and also for our managers to monitor and review the staff well-being. And ito talaga, no? minimize watching, reading, or read, listening to news about COVID-19. Talagang ano yan? If we always listen to the news about COVID-19 and how bad it is, talagang tayo ay super na may stress. Next slide. So, and then there are multiple medical and personal demands. You know, uh, kada papasok tayo sa trabaho, may nagbabagong guideline, right? Di ba? Halos araw-araw may nagbabago. You just had a day off for three days when you come back, everything already changed. And then um, separation from family members. Like I have a daughter who's also a nurse and we don't see each other that often anymore because she works in a, in a COVID unit. So she's afraid I might get COVID. I'm afraid I might get COVID from her. Fears of infection and you know, infecting family members. And the inner conflict about personal and professional needs. You know, many nurses are thinking, am I really going to continue to be a nurse? Malaking question din yan. Next slide, please. The stigma. You know, anybody who gets COVID-19, parang, oops, kahit na ano na, uh, asymptomatic na siya, gumaling na siya, Parang ayaw pa rin ka usapin. And you know, I have a co-worker who had COVID-19 and people were afraid. And so we had to discuss about it. And I work with health professionals. Next slide, please. And of course, you know, in New York and some other places, pag lumalabas na sa trabaho yung mga healthcare workers, some people come and say thank you to them and they start clapping and you know it really feels good the guys sa amen the the fire department and the police department they come to our workplace and then they they just you know they just uh, turn on the sirens to say that thank you for being the frontline workers nakaka ano yan talaga nakaka boost talaga ng morale and then, um, lang yan, you know, like I got a call from Domino's Pizza. They said, hey, during Nurses Week, can we give your nurses some pizza? Of course. Who doesn't like pizza? Next slide, please. So, um, this is, you know, um, something that we can do regular check-ins with friends, brief relaxation, stress management, 
regular peer consultation, and time out for basic bodily care. Uh, there are many companies who are sending healthcare professionals some, you know, yung mga lotion na stress, stress lotions, a lot of freebies. Uh, it, it was really one of the best nurses week that we had during the pandemic because so many people, you know, they were just giving a lot for the nurses to utilize. And I think uh, there's one more slide, which may be the last slide. Okay, so remember, avoid working too long without checking in with others. Working around the clock with few breaks and try to not feel that we have we, we haven't done enough. Too much sweets and caffeine, you know, yung mga ang, ang dugo nila ay nananalay tayo, eh, hindi na dugo kundi kape. And, um, you know, it would be self, you know, erasing these things that it would be selfish to take time to rest. Others are working around the clock, so I should also do that. The only thing that we can do in this pandemic is to be sure that we are actually taking care of ourselves very well. Because if we don't take care of ourselves, then we will not be able to take care of patients. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ma'am Norio, for that very informative and well-versed talk. I would like to acknowledge the presence of Ma'am Rajel Martinez Belen, past ORNAP National President. Welcome, Ma'am. Again, may I request everyone to turn on their webcams for us to take screenshots of the participants as part of the attendance. Again, may I request everyone to turn on their webcams for us to take screenshots of the participants as part of the attendance. We have also sent a survey to your email and kindly check for the link that was sent to your Zoom chat box. Please do comply and submit the survey afterwards to receive the certificates. Now, we will go ahead and take some time for questions. Yeah. Just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions into the chat box in your control plan panel. Yeah, I, I saw a question asking about N95. Yes, ma'am. Okay. to know if, um, are our Filipino nurses tested for N95 mask fit? Are people tested if... Uh, on the type of N95 masks, or we, do we just get N95 masks? Or No, we, we haven't, ma'am. Okay, so the question was, um, what, what is the recommendation if uh, there are no N95 masks and people have not been fit tested? Okay, so uh, if, if you look at, you know, some of the slides, th this is something that, um, is very uh, a very practical question because uh, N95 are very expensive. If you have N95 masks, then you can just microwave it. <laughs> they can be reused. Uh, but if there are no N95 masks, the, the thing to remember is what are things we have to be sure about the engineering control of the room. How many air exchanges does the room have? for us to know, okay? The other one is to shorten the exposure time to aerosol generating procedures. <coughs> Kaya nga ang sabi ko, <coughs> give me a moment. <coughs> That's why I said that <coughs> um, we have to know what are the procedures that we are assisting in that are aerosol generating. So if there is no choice but to assist in these procedures, 
the exposure and the number of people exposed to this should be the minimum time. Pagkatapos niyan, uh, tingnan din kung ano yung air exchange. Na pa para yung particulates in the room are sucked out of the room to protect us. And the minimum protection that people need to have is to have a type 2 surgical mask and a face shield that covers even the sign. Yun, yun yung, um, that is the most practical way to manage it. I hope I was able to. Ma'am, good morning. Yes. Good morning. I have a follow-up question with that, ma'am. Uh, yes. Sabi niyo po kasi with regards to N95, so dapat ang gagamitin natin is yung fitted for us. Yes. Uh, so ma'am, para po sa inyo, eh, ang supplies po sa government, I think, is iisa ang supply. Coming from the DOH supply, pare-parehas po ang sizes. So yeah. with regards to that, pwede po ba namin gamitin pa rin yung N95 na not fitted for us? If yes. that's the okay. case. Yeah, yeah, you, you can still use it. So how do you uh, know kung siya ay um, effective sa'yo? So you do the, yung parang kailangan nakaano siya sa ilong, you know, you fit it to your nose and then try to breathe in and out. Kung bagay ito yung N95, tingnan mo kung na-feel na, na mo na lumalabas yung hangin sa side. So, so ganyanin mo. You know what what we sometimes do is uh, kasi nakikita ko rin yan you know during the the time of the pandemic na wala ng mga supplies yung ibang hospitals some people because the N95 needs to be sealed dito kailangan na seal siya talaga kaya i-fit siyang mabuti and try to put it the contour around that's the only way. And then, uh, yung iba, kasi, uh, lalo na yung N95 po, eh, matagal mo nang ginagamit, nilalagyan nila ng surgical mask on top. And then, kagaya mo, nakatakip yung buhok mo ng, ano, ng uh, ha uh, hair cover. Okay, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it will be a very good project for, you know, for ORNAP Iloilo to, uh, to create that important standard of care that at least, you know, people need to be fit tested with N95 because we have so many uh, mga kapwa nurses natin who passed away because of COVID-19. Okay, ma'am, there, there is another question here from Ma'am Helen. If the patient is negative for COVID-19, but with AGP, are we still going to use full PPEs regardless of any procedure that uses cautery? Thank um, you, ma'am. If um, negative for COVID-19, um, negative din ba siya sa symptom screen? If the patient is negative for COVID-19, negative for the symptom screen, then you don't need to use that. You don't need to take the precautions. It's just regular. Okay, ma'am. Uh, uh, remember... Remember the problem that we have in the operative area are those who are uh, people who are asymptomatic, but they test positive. That's why the use of the test is very powerful for that point in time. Remember, they have to test negative and they would have isolated for the period before the procedure and then you screen them for signs and symptoms, they should also be negative. If they are positive for the symptom screen, negative for the test, you assume that they got infected and so you use your precautions. 
Kaya yung nurse, napaka-critical niya. Because it is the nurse who will do the screening. Okay, ma'am. Uh, there is another question, ma'am, from Sir Emmer Flores. Is KN95 the same as N95 mask? Because now KN95 mask is widely used in the Philippines. There are some studies and articles that says that KN95 is not safe and not the same compared to N95 mask, ma'am. Um, kapag ba sinabi mong KN95, uh, is that also fit tested? No, ma'am. Ganun din? Kasi, you know, look at it this way. As I said, these masks are only as good if they are, if a person is fit tested. Mm -hmm. Masks that we use, if we are not fit tested, we have to um, take other precautions to protect us. Okay? Kaya, kaya yun yung mahirap. Alam ko, even in, in our uh, hospital, we are looking into other options for other N95 masks. And, and so, uh, the, the, the important thing is, it, it's the fit testing that, that needs to be, you know, that needs to be uh, implemented. If, if anybody is that fit, fit tested, N95, it's K95. Uh, why it's called 95? Because it means it filters 95% of the air particulate. Whatever is the type of mask, kasi nasa Pilipinas, ano, just make sure that talagang i-ano -i siya, i-hold -i masya sa contour ng face. And then use extra precaution, use the face shield to be sure. Okay. Okay, ma'am. There's still another question here, ma'am, from staying with Sir Emmer Flores. The mode of transmission of COVID-19 is droplet, but now is COVID-19 going airborne? airborne? Um, it, it's still, um, nagaaway pa sila, but we know that it's both. It's both. Um, kaya we, we, we have to get this really well. Remember, if you are doing um, if you are doing aerosol generating procedures, the mode of transmission during those procedures is airborne. Okay? Kasi meron lamang procedures na nag-generate ng small amount of droplets that we can inhale directly to our lungs that can infect us. Kaya nga sabi ko, um, it protects us. For example, kagaya sa, sa clinic namin, we identified the procedures that will generate aerosol. If somebody is attending to these procedures, they should use N95. Tapos, yung all the rest, kunwari, yung mga nasa general clinic lamang, at tumitingin sila ng mga pasyente na inuubo, they're doing vital signs, okay? Or they are, you know, they are uh, doing some swabs, kunwari, nagninasopharyngeal swab and everything, hindi yan nag-generate ng aerosol. So, ang ginagamit lang dyan ay mask at saka face shield. Remember, type 2 mask. Yung mga dentist, ang ginagamit nila, type 3. Okay? At least, ang gagamitin natin dapat, type 2. Gan gan industry grade yon. So, uh, kaya sabi ko, pareho siya Kasi when it is a droplet precaution, those are the situations where kung uubo man yung pasyente, the droplet is, you know, huge enough that it falls to the floor. 
but when you do intubation or other procedures that generate aerosol, then those are airborne precaution. Maliwanag ba siya o magulo? Hello, ma'am. Yes. There may mag-share po ng experience or yung situation here po dito sa Pilipinas. Okay. Uh, from Sir Miguel Labayan po ito, ma'am. Yeah, okay. um, isang problema is based on history, most people underwent swapping and dapat mag-quarantine, hindi nagko-comply, ma'am. Tapos, uh -huh. after few Not days pa ang operation. Kaya for us, minimum level of precaution is level 3 for patient with negative RT-PCR. So, share ya lang po. Tapos, ma'am, I still have a question. Yung validity okay. of RT-PCR result po, ma'am, for patient, patients scheduled for OR, how long po yun? Um, kasi sa amin, um, if, if they, it, it's like this. Um, when um, the turnaround time for the tests, the PCR test is so vital. Most, most institutions now, the turnaround time is just within six hours. Okay? Um, yung iba, um, they, uh, they are using like within 24 hours. Because we are cognizant that not everybody is following the instructions to isolate. Hindi sila sumusunod. Kaya nga, yung mga outpatient procedures na they are still procedures but they are not major procedures. Uh, the patient is tested two days before. Mm -hmm. But for those procedures that will definitely generate aerosol, the recommendation is really that they do the testing. It, it's a long wait time but they are tested in the hospital. And then they have to wait for, for those procedures. But again, if there is a doubt about uh, the patient, um, a, a surgical procedure needs to be done. And you know, it has to be done right now. And the test result is not available. The assumption is always treat the patient like the patient is infected. Ganoon. Kasi mahirap na ang ano, um, nag ka, ay, okay lang yan. Mamaya, lahat kayo naka-quarantine. Wala nang matitirang mga nurses. We had the hospital where I think there were like um, people were exposed and more than um, more, more than 20 of the employees needed to be quarantined. And so practically, nagsara yung unit. Okay, I think there's a question about what about in, uh, in emergency situations. In emergency situations, again, we will go back. Is the, is the procedure going to generate aerosol? So, so lagi, doon tayo lagi bumabalik. Aerosol generating ba yung procedure na yan? Kung ang sagot ay yes, at you are not sure about the status of the patient, we take the maximum precautions, which is a big expense, a lot of PPE that needs to be used. Kaya babalik na naman yan doon sa how much supplies do we have. Kaya nga yung toolbox natin, kailangan laging namomonitor yung supplies natin. If the turnaround time in testing is very poor, it will do a lot of things. It will eat up all our PPE. Mm. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am Fabi, you have a question? Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning, Colette, ma'am. Uh, Bridget Lau. Uh, my question po ako, ma'am. Uh, do you have any idea po regarding the biofilm RA? Kasi po dito sa Iloilo ngayon, there are some hospitals who uh, which tends to observe this uh, swab test aside from the RT-PCR. May idea po ba kayo uh, about po dito? Um, kasi, um, you know, there, there's a wide variety of tests that are uh, coming up right now. 
like for example, uh, all I can say is the gold standard is still nasopharyngeal, even in the US. Saliva test, which is very cheap, very short turnaround time, it was used by Yale. And um, kahit kami sa university, we have not embraced it yet. Ganun pa rin ang ginagawa namin. It's got to be the gold standard. Inaaral namin. And uh, we are going to do some clinical trials soon to compare the test result of a nasal swab, nasopharyngeal swab, and a saliva test. So, antibody test, wala tayong gaanong pag-asa dyan. Antibody test doesn't really tell us a lot. Wala, wala halos. Uh, we, in fact, we're not even encouraging people to do it right now. We're still, as I'm saying, um, for the past two weeks, we have tested around 4,000 students using the nasal, uh, nasal swabs. And um, we have uh, inconclusive test results that we have uh, repeated you doing nasopharyngeal, and they both tested positive, it means that they were comparable for negative. The only difficulty we have is um, we need to find if the positive for a nasal swab is the same as a positive for a nasopharyngeal. Otherwise, um, I cannot really make comments on other tests because based on my experience, my personal experience, that is the extent of the science that we are practicing right now in terms of infection control. We're sticking our guns to these two types of PCR tests. Okay, ma'am. Thank you very much. There's still another question, ma'am. Question here uh, asking um, how do you manage emergency surgery when uh, PCR is not available? What is your point of screening? So uh, in, 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 a, in a situation where there's an emergency and we cannot wait, we still do the PCR test, but uh, we wait, we practice the maximum precaution and then uh, we, we still, you know, the, the result of the test is still uh, valuable so that people who did the the surgery, especially if it's aerosol generating, they know that, hey, uh, did we do the right precaution and um, it's an aerosol generating. So, kumbaga, ano na lang yan, ex post facto na nalaman mo, oh, positive pala siya. And then, uh, there's another question, how often do you disinfect your popper? Every, if you use a popper, you use it for you. Uh, you don't, um, as long as you're using it, you don't disinfect it, but if somebody else is going to use it, then that's the time that you disinfect it. Kanya-kanya kami ng popper na suot. I mean, nobody uses my popper. It's just my own popper for the shift. Kasi lalo na kung uh, I will be uh, uh, there in the room for a long time. And, and there's a the training for popper. Um, lahat ng mga empleyado, they have to be trained to use a popper and it is an annual competency. Okay, ma'am. Noted. Ma if there is another question from Sir Frey Lewis. In your clinic, what are some definite, definitive self-care programs for nurses have you done? Yeah, we do. Uh, so... Part of self-care, kahit sa Amerika, mahilig kami sa pagkain. You know, um, we do uh, a lot of employee appreciation. So, uh, in fact, um, ano yan, yung... It, it's very interesting. The way we do it is we have one to take care of ourselves. Like, for example, magluluto kami ng, ano, ng tacos. Kanya-kanya kaming dala. It's just one recipe. Each of us will be bringing ingredients. And then we put it together at work. So it's like each of us, we have a part. And then we create this. And minsan, um, 
some of the physicians they would uh, do something for our you know our nurses to appreciate or um, like the the university um, decided to say for the for the care of the staff thank you so much for being uh, there to help our patients so we may, may bring a ano, jacket which is kasi malapit na ang winter so may libreng jacket na binibigay so so we have we have these things and then um we i'm very fortunate that we are in a university that uh, has provided a lot of if, if somebody is sick that is covid related we have 128 hours of paid leave kapag nagano ka na um, kunwari ako um, I cannot go back to work I, I I have the option of using 128 hours for of my COVID leave and if uh, there are problems in child care my nurses are able to take a leave with and they are paid kasi mga bata they are staying at home homeschooling ngayon so part of caring for the family is they can they can take a leave and they are being paid their salary 128 hours plus meron bang 80 hours if they need some more time and it's not just for nurses it's for all employees who are affected by covid uh, in fact um, some of our uh, healthcare providers yung mga age uh, ano na sila 60 and above they have the option of working from home doing telehealth because they belong to the vulnerable population and i have one nurse who is pregnant so this this nurse as part of self care we are not allowing her to do swabbing of covid patients yon Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Is there other questions? Ma'am, sirs, everyone, you would like to share or ask to ma'am Norio? Okay. Can I just say thank you to everyone? Um, You know, I have very good memories of Iloilo. Uh, uh, when I was still in the Philippines, nagre-review ako dati sa Iloilo, sa NG Review Center. I don't even know if it still exists. Um, I'm friends with Danet uh, De Leon. I don't know if she's still there. So uh, I have very good memories from, from Iloilo and uh, I treasure the place and the people because they are so very kind. And of course, I, I would like to thank, you know, Ray. Just so you know, Ray designed my wedding gown and he sang for my wedding. <laughs> okay. Well, it looks like we've covered all our questions. Ma'am Norio, is there anything else you wanted to cover no, up? No, uh, ju no. Just be saying thank you for allowing me to share. Okay. Thank you very much, Ma'am Norio. Okay, so that would be all. Thank you so much, Ma'am Bridget Launario, for being our resource speaker for our webinar entitled OR Nurses COVID-19 Toolbox on Infection Control. I hope everyone has learned a lot today, and I hope so that we put into practice what we have gathered today's lesson. Okay. Now that we have come to an end, oh, Ma'am, do you still have to share? Okay, now that we have come to an end, to formally close this webinar, may I call on Ms. Febi Andley Butake of St. Paul's Hospital Iloilo, or NAP Iloilo Chapter, Secretary and Seminar Coordinator to give her closing remarks. So, thank you. Thank you, Ma'am Yetsi. Uh, uh, our moderator for today, together with Sir Feb Mark Lapasora.
uh, all things, all good things must come to an end, meaning nothing lasts forever. All things and situations are temporary or happiness is fleeting. As we are about to end our webinar for today, we would like to give thanks and appreciation to the few good people who have been so supportive of this organization. To our resource speaker, Ms. Maria Bridget Launario, who is currently in California today. Thank you, Mom, for your time and knowledge uh, that you have shared with us today. I believe it is in these times that being knowledgeable and well-informed of the up-to-date issues in the healthcare system is a way of protecting ourselves and those around us. To the ORNAP National and the ORNAP Iloilo Chapter Advisors, thank you for your support and for just entirely pushing us to our limits to be the best that we can be. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Lastly, we also would like to thank and acknowledge the RA GAPUS Review Center, the IT staff, for our technical support for today. Thank you for helping us get connected to each one and for just entirely making this webinar smooth and organized. And of course, to you all guys, the ORNAP members, who continually support the organization's activities amidst this pandemic, thank you very much. So good things may end, but that also means that something good is bound to follow. We hope to see you again on our succeeding activities as we keep you posted on our Facebook account or in our Iloilo chapter. Thank you again and be safe, guys. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. We appreciate you being here. And may I inform you that this is not the last webinar that ORNAP Iloilo will be conducting. There will be more in the future, so please encourage your friends and colleagues and approach your ORNAP chapter BODs to sign up and be a member of the Perry Operative Registered Nurses Association of the Philippines. Again, I am Mitzi Feire, your host for today. Thank you again for joining us and we will see you next time. I would like to remind all that we have sent a survey to your email or Zoom link chat box. Please kindly check for the link so that the, to comply and submit the survey afterwards to receive the certificates. Thank you and God bless.